Hello and welcome back to another episode of Autism Family Life, your source for all things autism, family, and life in 30 minutes or less. In this week's episode, I want to bring my dialogue back to um, what it's like, you know, as a parent of an autistic child. And this week's episode is publishing on the day after my autistic daughter's 18th birthday. And the focus for this week's episode is actually going to highlight on a couple of things that we've, that I've heard um, over the years in these past, you know, 18 years of parenting her. And the reason that I want to get into this is because if you are a parent of a neurotypical child or if your neurotypical children um, are encountering autistic children, either at school or in a public park or something like that, I would love for you to keep an open mind and really kind of think about the things that, you know, maybe not so much that your child says, but that you say, because our kids, um, our neurotypical kids, they're so observant and they really do absorb a lot of what is going on around them, whether we as adults realize it or not. Um, I've noticed, you know, this is especially true for my neurotypical daughter. And um, she, she soaks up so much more, I think, than I really do end up giving her credit for, which is, you know, a mistake on my part. Um, so, but, but before I get into all of that, I would like to invite you to, you know, subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform it is that you happen to be listening, whether it's Spotify or Stitcher or iHeartRadio or um, Apple Podcasts or Google Play, or if you are tuning in on YouTube, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can get the updates there. And you'll have to excuse any kind of background noise. The It's about like 90 degrees here in Albany this week, so it's kind of hot. And um, I got the fan going, so just excuse me for that. So over the past 18-ish years, um, really since my son was old, uh, my, my oldest, who he's just turned 21, there have been a lot of pieces of, of so-called advice that I've heard, um, you know, as a parent of a, a child with special needs. And um, even with my kids who don't have special needs or that doesn't particularly pertain to my kid, their, their needs. And this so-called parenting advice, while I think most of the time it is meant to be helpful, there have been times where I've had to, you know, like bite my tongue or just had to really refrain from coming back with like a really snarky or sarcastic remark. And for me personally, that's really, really difficult to do. Um, I have a very you know, kind of smart personality. Um, I don't want to use the word. I'm a sarcastic person by nature. And um, sometimes I might say something in a particular way that really wasn't meant to be. Um, I'm that person that, you know, if you've ever seen the t-shirt that says, like, if my mouth doesn't say it, my face will, that's also me. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to do, the, um, to record these for YouTube as well as to put on the podcast. Um, because I understand, you know, there's a certain thing that you can, certain uh, messages that you can communicate with just using tone of voice inflection and things like that. But with the videos, you guys can see my facial expressions and um, I can be pretty expressive that way as well. But for purposes of this particular episode, I'm going to try to keep most of the, um, the expression in my voice instead of in my face. So we'll see how this goes. So again, these are those things, like those pieces of advice that you hear from people that you just kind of sit there for a minute and you might question. It's like, did this person really just say this thing to me? And you can already hear yourself, like the, 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 uh, the wheels are turning in your head of what kind of snappy comeback can you offer to this? Or is it even worth the time to respond? 
So here are just like a few things. Um, and the number one with a bullet has always been, I'm sorry. And the reason I hate hearing this from people is because they're making it sound like my child's um, special needs, my child's autism, my child's uh, cerebral palsy, my child's, um, even my, my, my youngest daughter, her high spirited or her highly sensitive personality, they're making it sound like it's some kind of burden. And I have to tell you, this is not a burden at all. My kids have taught me so much about myself. Um, and just as an individual and as a parent and I wouldn't trade this for the world because th there's just nothing in life that ever could have prepared me for being a parent of three children with extraordinary and exceptional needs absolutely nothing like no manual no book no movie no documentary no nothing except for this hands-on experience so even on those days that I might struggle or that I feel like I'm at the end of my rope, I'm not sorry for one minute of it because everything that I'm able to experience with my kids, every moment provides a new learning opportunity, whether it's a shift in the way I'm parenting them or if it's a shift in my own thought process. So that when people say that they're sorry for your child's special needs, I just those are the ones for me that just kind of trigger this response of i can't believe that just came out of your mouth or it just probably not so pleasant things number two is you know when someone would say to me oh well your daughter doesn't look autistic i'm like really i didn't think that there was a universal look for autism um uh, because sometimes you know when we think of autism, or at least, you know, before I became a parent of an autistic child, my biggest misconceptions about um, autistic individuals were that they were all like the character in Rain Man. So they were all savants, or they were all this, or they were all that. And uh, really, I didn't have much experience beyond that. So for me, um, I had to get past that when I had my own, when my daughter was diagnosed. And it's like, all right, you know, I, I kind of understand now what to look for. And I'm one of those people, too, that will sit, um, like, at the mall or at the park or for on the bus, wherever. And I will start diagnosing people in my head. Is it always the right thing to do? Probably not. But there are sometimes, you know, it just it's more obvious than others. Okay, so this person just might be on the autism spectrum. But does that mean that I'm going to go up to that person and say, Oh, your kid looks autistic. You might want to get them diagnosed. Absolutely not. Because it's rude and it's just not one of those things that you as a parent kind of want to hear. Um, you know, but sometimes you might get that parent who knows that their child is autistic and they take it jokingly. But you never know what that other parent is going through. So it's just one of those things that even if it does seem obvious to you, just kind of keep it to yourself. And yes, this is one of those things that I've had to tell myself as well. Um, number three is that the child is going to grow out of it. And I got a little news flash for you. Autism is a lifelong neurological disorder or disability, and it's not going to go away. Um, certain things may be a little bit less obvious, um, depending on the levels of therapy or the levels of adjustments that someone is able to make to their environment. But it does not go away, so no, my child is not going to grow out of it. Um, the number four is that my child is just being a brat. And again, newsflash for you, my child is not being a brat. My child is having a very difficult time navigating the environment and navigating the things that are going on around her. She is more than likely experiencing a very heavy case of sensory overload. And unlike you or me, she does not have the ability to regulate all the intense emotions and all the intense situations and overwhelming things that she's feeling. So it's just too much for her to process at this time, but she's not being brat. Um, the number five thing is that you can just spank the autism out of them, you know, like better. It's a behavioral issue. Um, 
and that they're just acting out because they're being a brat. Again, that goes to number four, but, you know, just spank the autism right out of them. And this is another one of those ones where I have to bite my tongue and turn and walk away because it's become that knee-jerk response to say, well, I can't spank the autism out of my child any more than I can slap the stupid or ignorance out of you. It's just not possible. And my number six is the, if you'd done something differently. And the reason that this one irritates me so much is because you don't know what I go through on a daily basis. You don't know what we've done through her IEPs. You don't know about the accommodations that we have made in our own home. You just don't know. So don't presume that we haven't tried something just because you've read about it or because you've seen it work with a neighbor's child. And to that same um, extent, you know, please just don't try to imply that it's going to disappear if we try these things. Uh, the number seven thing for me is that they just might need medication. And I will be the first person to say that while there is absolutely nothing wrong with putting your child on medication, if that's what they absolutely need to function and to get by, then put them on medication. But otherwise, I'm more open to exploring options that don't involve medication. And that is just my personal choice. Please respect that because that is my family's choice. And my number eight is that, you know, if you can't handle their intense moments, then maybe you just need to put them in a home or you need to put them, you know, in a psych ward or something. And that pisses me off because Again, you don't know what we have already tried. You don't know if my child is just having a particularly bad time at that moment or if I'm having a bad time at that moment. So please don't say something like that without knowing the entire context of the situation. Number nine is, did you vaccinate? And I don't go into this a lot on my blog. I will go into this on another episode of the podcast because this is another rant um, entirely about vaccinations and autism. And bottom line for me is that there's just too much scientific research out there to say that there is no um, concrete link between autism and vaccines. So please do not come at me with that unless you have um, read the research, if you've done the research, and then you are prepared to back up your statements and your arguments with facts. So number 10 is the, well, so-and-so, and I won't say her name on this podcast, said that her child is cured, so maybe you should try what they did, and then the autism will just disappear. And this ties into the number 11, which is the, I'll pray for a cure. The reason that these two things make me so angry, which is the, um, this person said that her child is cured or, you know, that they'll pray for a cure. When you're saying that there's a cure for autism, you are implying that the child with autism or the autistic child has a disease and they don't have a disease. This is not something that you're going to, okay, so we all die of old age, but you don't die from autism. You don't die from being autistic. This is a neurological disorder. It's not a disease. There's no cure for autism. So for people to say that they're actively looking for a cure, and you know, like one of the most recent ones that I was reading about in a very horrific manner are the people who are um, the bleach. They're, they're having their kids drink bleach and then they're killing their intestines. So you're slowly, very slowly poisoning your child. And again, I, I'm, I'm going to save this one for another episode because I'm going to go on a long winded rant and I just don't, I don't have the emotional, the energy right now to really handle that. So I'm going to back off from the, the 10 and the 11, which are both related to the, um, the cure talk, but just know that is one of my biggest, big triggers. And that if you ever bring this up to me in conversation, be prepared for me to start ranting. Uh, okay, so number 12 is that, um, you know, your, your nephew, your niece, or your neighbor's cousin, or whomever, they have autism. So you completely understand what I'm going through. And I have to say, that's probably a little crap. 
because you don't. You aren't in our house daily. You aren't in our situations daily. You aren't in my particular shoes, in my situation. You don't deal with the things that I deal with on a daily basis. So while you may say that you you have some understanding of what's going on, you don't fully understand. Um, and I don't say this to be dismissive of people who say that they understand because I try to say that to people as well. It's like, I can relate to what you're going through. I don't fully understand what you're going through, but I can definitely relate to what you're going through. So maybe just think of a way to rephrase it. The next thing that really gets me going with people when they say these things is that your child is not autistic enough. And this is one of those things that I see in some of the autism support groups where people are saying that um, the moms of the, and this is why I hate labels, but moms of the high functioning autistic kids just don't get it and all the struggles that moms of low functioning autistic kids go through. It would be the differences now um, if you're following the DSM V5 with um, kids who are like in between the one and two range versus kids who are between like three, four, or whatever it is, I'm still not fully up to speed. But I hate that talk and I hate that train of thought because you're implying that your struggles are bigger or that your struggles are greater. And that's just, again, it's a load of crap because we all struggle as parents. We are always questioning what we're doing. We're always questioning if we're enough. And we're always going to question if we are good enough and we don't need that kind of negativity and um, divisiveness within the community when there's already enough of it, both in our own inner dialogue and outside of the community. And this is another one that I've seen, you know, it divides the community as well, is that you, if you use person first or if you use disability first. And even people who are saying, you know, we don't call it a disability, it's a disorder. I use both interchangeably. So I say my child with autism or I have a teenager with autism. And I will also say I have an autistic teenager. Um, for people who are able to self-identify and say, you know, if they have preferences, and I think we, the least that we can do is to acknowledge those preferences. So if you meet an adult who says, I am an adult with autism or I'm an autistic adult, don't try to correct them into what you think they prefer because they have clearly communicated to you what they prefer. And one of the last things to that really gets me going with all of this is that I don't know how you do it. And quite honestly, some days I don't know either, so I just do. It's not something that I've really stopped very long to think about because it's to me, this is what parents do. This is what you're supposed to do. We do the things that we need to do as parents to make it through each day. We don't question the hows. We don't question the whys. It's just what we do. And for, you know, for people to say these things, it's like, well, I don't know how you can manage. Honestly, sometimes I don't know how I manage either because sometimes I don't. Sometimes it does get really overwhelming for me and sometimes I feel like giving up and sometimes I feel just like so overwhelmed with having to do all the things. But at the same time, those are the moments that I want to, you know, grant myself the grace and say, okay, so I did get all the things done today, but I got some of the things done today and some of the things it's better than nothing. And then there might even be the days where I don't get anything done. And again, that's okay too. You know, I've had to come to terms with my own, um, I have very high standards for myself. So I have to come to terms with that. And not everything is always going to meet those higher standards. So those are my 16 things. And when you click over to the show notes for this, you'll be able to see all of them listed out. Um, I can give you like a little brief recap of them right now. So the number one thing that triggers me as a parent of an autistic child is the I'm sorry. Uh, second is that he or she does not look autistic. Number three is that they will go, grow out of it. Number four is that they're just being a brat. Number five is just spank the autism out of them. Number six is maybe if you did something differently. Number seven is that they just need medication. Number eight is that if you can't handle them, 
put them in a group home or a psychiatric hospital. Number nine is, did you vaccinate? Number 10 is, so-and-so said that her child is cured. Number 11 is, I'll pray for a cure. Number 12 is, my niece, nephew, or neighbor's cousin has autism. I completely understand what you're going through. Number 13 is, oh, I did not say number 13. Number 13 is, why would you have more children even though you know you already have an autistic child? And quite honestly, this is really no one's business. You choose to have kids because you choose to have kids. Uh, period. So number 14 is your child isn't autistic enough. And this relates to the um, another rant of mine, which I will discuss in another episode of the podcast. And that is the high functioning versus low functioning terminology and why I can't stand labels. And that's not just for autistic kids. That's for just people in general. Labels are for things that are for sale. Labels are not for people because people are not for sale. So number 15 was the person first or um, a disability first. And number 16 was your life needs must be so hard. I don't know how you do it. So there's your recap. 16 things that this parent of an autistic child is pretty sick of hearing. You can find them all listed out on the show notes. If you have any that are triggering for you, I would love to know either in a comment on the YouTube video or a comment on one of the podcast platforms, wherever it is that you are. Or if you are reading the show notes while you are listening to the episode or after you listen to the episode, leave it in a comment on the show notes. And I will talk to you guys next week. And I hope you have an awesome day.